you so much for coming out tonight for this author talk. We are all just so delighted to have Leela here. This event would not have been possible without the hard work of all of our partners, of which there were many. By the way, I'm Jasper. I'm the programming coordinator at the Pearson. So in addition to us, we were joined by the Jericho Carpenter Cars. Charlotte and Lawrence Memorial Libraries and hosting pop-up book clubs, getting the word out. Of course, we are delighted to be partnering once again with the Flying Pig Bookstore, who had a total run on their copies of Beaverland. So they've got, they've got a lot tonight, um, and they'll have even more that will be autographed in the future. So come on down to order. Uh, when the time comes, if you could, a little bit of housekeeping, line up in the center aisle for the book signing, and Leela will sign the book. Of course, last but not least, how could we have possibly done this event without the partnership of Vermont Land Trust, which is a wonderful... <laughs> ...nonprofit organization here in Vermont promoting the environment. Uh, yeah, they're, they're incredible. I'd like to do a little land acknowledgement. We are here in historic town hall on the unceded land of the Western Abenaki people. Uh, we recognize the enduring injustice rooted in colonialism and systematic oppression faced by indigenous peoples. to say a little bit more about Vermont Land Trust and to introduce our speaker this evening. Would you join me in giving a warm welcome to the Ecology and Restoration Program Director of Vermont Land Trust, Alaire Diamond. Place, 
um, a Hudson Valley farm, three centuries, five wars, and one family. We've got a copy of that here for folks to check out. Um, the book Hidden Dialogue, a, di a discussion between women in Japan and the United States. Uh, the book of Miyama, and also a book of poetry called Water Rising. So with that, I want to welcome Lila. Um, Thank you so much. I think my first test was if I didn't trip over all the wires. So I passed the first test. Um, thank you so much to Alaire and Jasper and Vermont Land Trust, Vermont Ethic, um, all of you for being here. Um, I have to say, it's, it's really exciting for me to come and give the very first uh, kind of big talk and reading from Beaverland in Vermont, because Vermont's really uh, special to me. I've been coming to Vermont since before I could walk or talk. My grandfather built a little cottage on Willoughby Lake a long time ago, and so I've been spending part of my summer here uh, for a long, long time. In fact, a chapter from Beaverland was written um, on Willoughby Lake uh, up in the Northeast Kingdom. But I also want to thank Pearson Library and all the librarians um, who helped so much support uh, the conversations about Beaverland by running book conversation groups. Especially now, I think uh, public library is just one of the corners of our democracy. So I am here to speak a word about beavers. Um, really, uh, I spent a good six years researching this book, so you'd think I'd be done already. but. <laughs> I'm just as enthusiastic about the topic as ever. Can everybody hear me okay? It's a little hard for me to know. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, great. If for any reason you can't, would you just somebody let me know? So I don't just blab on and on and you don't know, <laughs> thanks. Um, so in Beaverland, I just wanna say a couple things about the book, about myself, and then we'll get started. I have a lot of information I wanna share with you. But in Beaverland, I wanted to share with readers a deep look into how beavers have indeed shaped this country and have really fascinated people since Pliny the Elder. And um, the more I learned about beavers, really the more intrigued I became and the more questions I had. But before I even talk about the book, I just wanna say a little bit about myself and how it all got started. I also thought, I want to do something I haven't done very much, which is to talk just a little bit about how I designed the book and wrote it. Some of the choices I made about what kinds of information went where. So I grew up, this is kind of stuttering, I guess it wants to get started. So um, I grew up on and off a farm in the Hudson Valley. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Hudson Valley, it's over there somewhere, but it's, you just go to Manhattan, go 100 miles north on the Hudson River, and you get to Hudson, and you go five miles inland, you get to a small village called Claverack. It's the old Dutch name, Claverach. And indeed, my father's family were Dutch traders once upon a time who came here, um, probably to trade for beaver pelts, and uh, they've been farming in the Hudson Valley ever since. But one of the great gifts, I think, of growing up on a farm is you're often hot and bored um, and I really think it, it was a gift more and more because as a kid I would end up in our little farm pond which was this kind of stinky, muddy place. And I spent a lot of my childhood chasing frogs, um, swimming with them when I could convince them to swim with me, chasing them. In many ways they were the prequel I think to beavers because frogs are these creatures that come on land with us for a while, but then they go into their water world. And we can only follow them for a little while. And beavers are very much like that. So I think one of the reasons beavers have fascinated humans everywhere for so long, myself included, is that for the most part, we see what beavers do, but we rarely see beavers themselves. Um, and what they do is, is quite incredible. So full disclosure, I discovered beavers by accident. I was literally taking a walk in the woods one day with my dog and I heard this bam. I thought maybe a gun had gone off. And I looked where my dog was looking and where the sound was coming from and bam, this sound again. And 
this previously dry area of the woods that was kind of a swamp where nothing really much that I thought was interesting had been happening was filling with water. And this little brown head was swimming back and forth and bam, she slammed her tail again. Mm -hmm. And it was a beaver and she had built a dam right there by the bridge. I write about it in Beaverland. And that was really the start, the kind of tenacity of this animal. And then I started watching the beaver and she started watching me actually. Um, and the transformation of the woods was incredible. It was like nothing I had ever seen. And growing up on a farm, I was exposed to the natural world. It set me on a trajectory of writing about humans and their intersections with the natural world. So I wasn't new, I thought, to the natural world, but I had never seen anything quite like this. So I set out to figure out what was going on and started reading everything I could find. And I learned pretty quickly that beavers actually jump-started the first economies in North America. So it was the lust for beaver pelts that sent the first ships racing across the Atlantic here to North America. And then by the 19th century, it would be beaver pelts and the beaver fur trade that would rev up the engines of capitalism here. So our first multimillionaire, John Jacob Astor, would get his start trading beaver pelts. But it wasn't just the first economies that beavers started here and the reason why they made America. They, before colonization, before the fur trade, they were in every watershed shaping the rivers that shaped the land. And it's no exaggeration to say that beavers were part of what shaped the boreal forests, the hardwood forests, the tremendous grasslands, the tremendous hydrology that would lead to the abundance of the North American flora and fauna is a result of the river system that back when beavers, about 400 million of them, were living throughout the continent, would have pulsed like a vast system of arteries throughout the land. Pretty much nothing like the river system we see today. So to imagine this is to imagine beaver land. So in my book, I wanted to share two equally startling things that I learned. And the first was that when we almost wiped beavers out through the fur trade, we initiated a period of environmental devastation that was so dramatic, river scientists, geomorphologists now call it the great drying. That was when the river system took a huge hit and we lost a great deal of the hydraulic function of our river systems. The second is that because people worked very hard in the early 1900s to bring beavers back, they're one of the greatest 20th century conservation success stories. So it's, it's, it's a pretty amazing story. So let's, let's talk about beavers. How many, how many of you have actually seen a beaver or seen a beaver dam? Okay, all right, so it's a beaver literate audience. That's great, <laughs> that's great, that's, that's my favorite. Um, I want to read you the first paragraph of the book. Um, for the most part tonight, I want to talk to you about um, some sort of research for the book and then get into a, a, a dive into the hydraulic hydrology that beavers bring to the river system because it's so pertinent today as we face climate change, particularly here in Vermont where issues of flooding are so much on everyone's minds. Beaver altered wetlands are um, tremendously valuable. In a counterintuitive way, beavers bring water, but they also create flood water storage and a tremendous amount of resiliency in the river system that actually helps manage flood water. So I want to talk about that. But um, this is just the first paragraph of the book, chapter one at the beaver pond. Kind of sums up what I learned about beavers. I think there's an element of the sacred in the beaver, if only in its deep weirdness. One million years ago, 
beavers the size of bears roamed North America. They pose an evolutionary puzzle like the platypus or birds which share some DNA with dinosaurs. And when they dive, they seem more like marine mammals than terrestrial species, more seal than rodent. Their dexterous forepaws look startlingly human with their five nimble fingers and naked palms. They groom their lustrous fur with cat-like fastidiousness. But their mammalian beauty ends abruptly in their goose-like hind feet, each as wide as the beaver's head. The feet are followed by a reptilian tail, which as it has been observed, looks like the result of some terrible accident. <laughs> Run over by a tractor tire, the treads leaving a pattern of indentations that resemble scales. Part bear, part bird, part monkey, part lizard, humanoid hands, an aquatic tail. Is it any surprise that beavers have fired the human imagination in every continent that they've been found? So that's how I start Beaverland. So beavers might not win an animal beaver contest. I grant you that. But I do think they have pretty amazing faces. And to me, one of the most amazing things about the beaver, um, I just want to say a couple things about the natural history of the beaver, um, is their paddle tail. So they have this tail that looks like it has scales, but it actually doesn't. They're, they're just indentations that resemble scales. And no one really understood why they had this feature that way until scientists discovered that actually the tail of a beaver is, is a kind of very sophisticated water sensor. So people did know that if they broke a beaver dam, beavers would come out really quickly and repair it, even if they didn't see it or hear it being broken. And um, now it's understood that, that beavers can feel very slight pressures in water pressure to their pond. So if the pond goes down, they understand that something has happened at the dam to release the water, and they go out and check. Um, Dr. Jordan Kennedy, a researcher who I profile in the book, I'll talk about her a little bit later, she measured in Montana that when the flow rate was exactly 2.5 liters per second, the beavers in Montana were out there, bam, ready to build their dams. Not, um, you know, not when it was slower, not when it was faster, exactly 2.5 liters per second. She had sophisticated measuring equipment. The beavers just had their tails, which I think is amazing. So they're highly adaptive. And these tails also serve as a refrigerator throughout the winter because beavers do not hibernate. They go into something called torpor. So their whole body chemistry slows down. They need less oxygen. They need less food. For the most part, they live off fat stored in the tail, which is why people actually liked to eat beaver tail. And in medieval times, the Catholic Church actually deemed that beavers were in water so much they could be considered fish. They could be eaten on Fridays. So um, it was kind of a cagey workaround because beaver tail was considered an aphrodisiac. So I don't know quite how they sorted that out, but they did. Um, anyway, um, this tail with its many, many blood vessels in it is also a kind of air conditioning system for the beaver because it cools the beaver down in summer. So I could go on and on about, about the beaver, but I, I, I want to share another slide with you, which is that um, these are some of the images of beavers um, as they've been understood throughout history. And you can see how wildly fantastic they are. So in Europe, in medieval times, by the 1500s, people figured out that the hair of a beaver, which is very lustrous, in fact, a postage size stamp of beaver fur has about 124,000 individual strands. That's about as much hair as a human has on its entire head. And all that uh, fur, that hair, is barbed. So they released it from the hide, and they made felt, which was incredibly durable. It was like the Gore-Tex of its day. And they figured out that this felt could be made into wonderfully strong hats, which is why by the end of the 1500s, 
beavers were pretty much extirpated from Europe, and which is why when they were discovered in North America, they were considered such an incredibly valuable commodity if they could get them back to Europe. But before people figured out how to make felt from beaver fur, they used beaver castor as medicine. Beaver have internal glands, castor glands, that they use for scent marking. And I had a lot of fun reading medieval accounts of medicine where beaver castor is considered a cure for everything from hysteria to insanity to blindness to headaches. Um, beavers eat willow, so there is some analgesic properties probably that was in the castor. It was probably something of a painkiller. But you can see how fantastic the, the depictions were, and they kind of go on and on. I just wanted to share this um, picture of actually the great beaver that existed in North America. Beavers were here in the Pleistocene, part of the megafauna. So along with saber-toothed tigers, we had beavers literally the size of bears. Um, kind of wish they'd come back. They could really help us. Um, but I also want to take a minute to mention that I, those of you who have read Beaverland know this, but I open the book with um, an Algonquin indigenous story of great beaver. In this story, um, it describes actually the forming of the Connecticut River Valley because a mischievous beaver um, starts flooding this small river to the extent that it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. It eventually forms the Connecticut River Valley and then the beaver has to be disciplined. And um, uh, the, there are great beaver stories all up and down the Atlantic seaboard and into the Great Lakes. Um, and it is clearly um, a teaching parable. It's also an origin story of how a lot of geographic features were um, formed uh, along the East Coast and into the Great Lakes. Um, many uh, people believe that these stories also hold paleo memories of the great beaver. Um, and this is actually a skeleton of the great beaver. Many fossils have been found throughout the East into the Midwest. Um, and there, there are many Algonquin stories about the dangers of hoarding resources, um, which the great beaver story is clearly one of. And these stories, which are some of the oldest stories of our continent, uh, are throughout North America, not just here in the East, but the Midwest, the arid high plains, the far west. And each of them uh, conveys also a very sophisticated understanding of the ecological importance of the beaver, which is what I want to get to next. So beavers did a lot of heavy lifting when it came to creating the rich, diverse, healthy ecosystem of North America. Because through the creation of their wetlands and ponds, they slow down, cleanse, store, and replenish the waters of North America, the river system. They've been given the term, they were dubbed ecosystem engineers. This is a term coined by the ecologist Clive Jones. They're the only animal, apart from humans, that creates the habitat they need to survive, which is really pretty amazing. They're a 36-inch rodent, really just a small creature. But lucky for us, they need water. And I want to just look at this slide with you to start unpacking why what they do is so incredibly valuable to us right now as we are facing the problems of accelerating climate change, drought, wildfire, dwindling supplies of groundwater, flooding, all these problems which have to do with water are problems that beavers can help us with and are helping us with. Every place that a beaver is out there building a pond, creating a wetland, is already doing that, is already restoring the river system. But throughout the country, people are working to harness beavers in environmental restoration programs. Um, out west, in places like California, Oregon, Washington, these states have gone really um, full scale with beaver management programs that are statewide. So what, why is this so important and how does it work? This, the slide on the right here 
is a classic beaver damming complex. So a beaver will come to a creek or a stream, which is part of the river system. It's the tributary part of the river system. Um, and they'll make a beaver pond. But they'll never just make one pond. Um, they'll make as many dams, really, as they have room for, because they know that a succession of dams helps support, each dam below helps support the dam above. It's just sort of good engineering. And the visible basin of water, in many ways, is just the beginning. So you can see in this slide from Wyoming, um, out west it's almost easier to see what beavers do because it's more open for the most part. Here in the east, beavers are often doing their wor work in the woods. And you might see their work in the woods, and it looks maybe like a series of shallow woodland ponds or a series of rice paddies in the woods. But here you can actually see the succession of dams, and you can see how far down they go. So if you imagine this creek as just a thread of water before, now the water has been pushed out laterally, and there's a lot of connectivity between soil and water on either side. But if we think about the basin of water that we can see as just the beginning, what's important to think about is that underneath every beaver pond is an invisible sponge of water in the soil that's holding at least three times as much water underneath. This is water we can't see, but is incredibly valuable to the river system. So that huge sponge of water is there to rehydrate the creek or the stream if a drought comes. And it's also there to soak up water if a rain event comes, if there's a flood. So you know, we all know in our kitchens that even a wet sponge holds water. And this is exactly what happens with each of these beaver ponds, which is the visible basin of water and then this huge sponge underneath. These sponges, called wetlands, are also um, considered the kidneys of the river system because they cleanse water. So water is slowed down as it goes through this large spongy area. It acts like a giant coffee filter. So sediment is filtered out, but also, and this is very relevant for us here in the East, serious pollutants like nitrogen and phosphorus. So study after study has been showing the extent to which beaver wetlands efficiently cleanse water, which means that not only is water slowed down so that it re-enters the aquifer, recharging it, but the water that gets down into the aquifer is actually clean. So in the Chesapeake, there's a lot of work going on to use beavers to cleanse the tributaries and the waters that are going into the Chesapeake because the Chesapeake is so polluted. And trying to clean it is such a concern. In the Milwaukee, um, there's a study I cite in the book where they're really concerned with flood water there. And funded, actually, by the sewage department of Milwaukee, they did a sophisticated study where they calculated that something like 59 colonies of beavers in the 900 square miles of the upper Milwaukee watershed. And this is open land where these beavers would not be creating problems for anybody. They wouldn't be flooding anyone's septic. They wouldn't be flooding any roads. Uh, within 25 years, those beavers would be creating 1.7 trillion gallons of flood water storage annually. And that much water perks people up fast because it has a dollar value of $3 billion annually. So not just in this, in this country, but in Europe, um, in Scotland, in other places, uh, in the UK, people are putting dollar values to the what call, they call ecosystem services that beavers do, storing flood water, et cetera, which costs a lot of money to build flood water storage. So on the left uh, is the beaver dam, actually, that I've been observing near my house. I'm going to talk a little bit about that toward the end of my talk here. Um, but I just want to share a fun fact with you, which is that the largest animal construction on the planet is a beaver dam. Um, again, this very small animal. Um, it's in northern Alberta. And what's significant about this, it's 2,790 feet long. Um, 
so what's significant about this is that these beaver damming uh, complexes endure. And um, some of the proof of that has come from interesting sources, including a book written by Lewis Henry Morgan called The American Beaver and His Works that he published in 1868. So I want to share with you a little bit of information about Lewis Henry Morgan. So I had so much fun uh, reporting this book. I met incredible people in the present, environmentalists, wildlife managers, a beaver whisperer in Chesapeake who was um, harnessing beaver to clean the Chesapeake, but also Lewis Henry Morgan, who was a person in the past. So Lewis Henry Morgan was a 19th century industrialist so he was busy helping build the country, and he reflects very much a deep American history of unfettered resource extraction. But like me, he met beavers by accident, and um, for him it was quite inconvenient. It actually led him on a 15-year year U-turn away from other work, because he would spend 15 years documenting beaver dams and beaver sites in the Upper Peninsula. He became just completely taken by beavers and the magnificence of the dams, the engineering that he was observing. And he just kept going back to this question, how can this rodent do this? How can this small animal do this? It's actually a question that he would never answer because he was um, really not really prepared to think holistically, I think, about beavers in his time because he was still very much engaged with the railroad companies in exploiting the environment that was going to end up destroying the habitat. But we're very um, lucky that he spent so much time documenting them because he would create this map here. And what he would end up doing was actually map one of the last vestiges of beaver land in North America. Um, I would take this map out to Michigan and say, well, I want to see if I can find any of these places. And actually, I did. I found Grass Lake Dam and a couple other places. I write about it in the book. And what was incredible was that I was looking at these places 150 years later, and there were beavers still working on these sites. So it raised interesting questions. Not only are they the largest animal constructions, but they endure. And successive generations of beavers were working on them. So the question of beaver intelligence um, was picked up very much by this person here, Dorothy Richards. Um, and she's another person I had a lot of fun writing about in the book. So Dorothy Richards, um, who had the moniker the beaver lady in her lifetime, was born at the end of the Gilded Era. She came of age in the Great Depression. By the end of her life, she had founded the first beaver sac sanctuary in the East, probably in the entire country. She had saved up enough money to put aside 600 acres in um, the lower Adirondacks. And she wrote a book about her whole um, experience called Beaver Sprite, which I recommend. But she um, also discovered beavers by accident. I had mentioned that there were efforts made to bring beavers back in the 1900s. So that began in 1905. New York State brought beavers back. Connecticut started bringing them back in 1914. Probably the wackiest was Idaho. They parachute dropped beavers in boxes, literally into the wilderness. Um, but what's amazing is actually those beavers did survive, at least some of them. Uh, this January, NASA ran satellite um, imagery over the area to see what it was looking like. And they found that in this very arid area, uh, there's green refugia. And sure enough, when they honed in, they were beaver wetlands. So the beavers got to work and repaired the river system there. But in 1932, um, some guys from the Forest Service showed up at her door with two beavers in a burlap sack and said, hey, can we release these beavers in your creek? And she said, OK. And then she went out to watch them, and the rest is history. She really was just fascinated by them. In 1938, she petitioned the state to let her raise two beavers in her house. And um, I don't think the state would let anybody do that today. But 
She raised them, she said, for educational purposes, and she spent the rest of her life dedicated to studying beavers, advocating for beavers, and trying to convince people to shift their cultural practices from thinking about beavers as pests to recognizing that they were much more sophisticated in terms of their emotional intelligence than people had thought and their general intelligence. So this raises the question of you know, beavers, how do they do what they do, which um, has not really ever been fully answered. But Dorothy Richards made some efforts in that in that direction. Here she is with Eager, her favorite beaver, having tea. Yes, she's having tea. By the end of her life, she was living in a small farmhouse with 14 beavers. Um, it, it was a little, little over the top. I think this is a little, little bit of a setup. But um, interestingly, Dorothy Richards was one of the first people to say, beavers do not just do what they do on instinct. They aren't just triggered by the sound of running water to pick up a stick and drop it. Um, it's, it's, there are more powers of reasoning going on here. And in fact, they have a very um, deep sense of emotional attachment to one another and a, and a more um, kind of engaged uh, social set of social relationships than had been thought. And we know this to be true today. Be beavers are actually monogamous rodents, which is un fairly unusual. They mate for life. Uh, they raise their kits for two years with a lot of attention. Um, and then at two years, usually the kits go out. Although there have been a lot of anecdotes of, from researchers of adult kits coming back to the original family, the original lodge, and living with their original lodge, like bungee kids coming back, um, <laughs> and, and being aunties and uncles that help take care of the kids. So they have a family, kinship family structure that um, is very, um, uh, really endures. And many of Dorothy's observations about beavers have actually been supported recently by this beaver right here, Nibby. She's a social media sensation. Um, she's being raised at the Chelmsford Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. And what's interesting about Nibby is that the first year of her life, she didn't like other beavers. She didn't like sticks. And she's being raised very carefully for release. She's not a pet. Um, but they put some kind of toys out to see what she would do. She grabbed this ball, and she just didn't let it go. So um, it was really interesting. Eventually, she started dam building behavior. But what she did was she demonstrated to people that for her, playtime and dam building time were very, very different activities. If her handler tried to put toys with her stick, she'd get very mad. Um, she played tricks on her handlers the way Dorothy Richards had observed. And the point is that um, I like to bring this up because thanks to the work of animal behaviorists like the late Franz de Waal, we know that Capuchin monkeys have a keen sense of justice. We know that octopus dream. We know that dogs have a rich emotional life. We're at a frontier of thinking in new ways about animal cognition and the emotional lives of animals. So Dorothy was on the forefront of that. She was just ahead of her time. Um, another person that I learned a great deal from about beavers in the present, in addition to wildlife managers, et cetera, was this man here who was actually a fur trapper. So the beavers that I uh, was were watching disappeared. Um, and I write about this in the book. And it was actually um, Herb Sabansky, this fur trapper, who helped me figure out what happened to them. And in many ways, became my first mentor in learning about beavers. And this was really paradoxical and surprising to me. And in many ways, um, not only did he teach me a lot about the natural history of beavers, but he disrupted in many ways, um, in good ways, the way I was thinking about um, the whole, my whole relationship to the natural world. And this is something that I'll get to later. But um, at some point in my research on the book, I make a very um, important discovery about the stone walls surrounding the beaver pond where I am uh, 
observing my beavers. And that leads me into a deep dive into a pretty dark side of American colonial history and the impact of colonization, not just on the environment, but on the indigenous peoples who have always lived in rural Connecticut and in, in the town of Woodstock where I live. And um, I, I research that quite deeply. And after I finished researching that, it takes me about three months, uh, I realized that um, one of the big takeaways that I wanted to share in the book was my journey of understanding in terms of coming to realize that one of the most important things we need to do now is reset our relationship to the natural world. And along that line, everything I had learned from her became much more important. So I actually decided to put um, the, the kind of profile of him early on in the book. The book begins with an indigenous story of Great Beaver and then goes pretty quickly into a profile of a fur trapper, a, a marginalized group. And my thinking about this was, um, I love books that, through the way the story is told, tell you something about the story itself. And I really wanted Beaverland to challenge readers in the way I had been challenged to disrupt, rethink a little bit a lot of our assumptions about not just the natural world, but about how we were approaching thinking about the natural world. And it was pretty much um, the usual way of writing environmental narrative was to go to the Western um, scientist and posit them as the expert first and then do other types of information as secondary. And I wanted to reverse that. So we have indigenous environmental knowledge first, then we have a marginalized fur trapper, and then we get to the Western scientists, Dr. Berkstead and, and many others. So that was just um, important for me to, in the, in the design of the book. But we need to talk a little bit about the way history has treated the beaver. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you know exactly what a beaver felt hat looks like, so I thought I would include a slide of that. When I started this book, I, I was mistaken. I thought it was like a Daniel Boone hat, but that's a raccoon. <laughs> so um, actually, beaver felt hats, everybody wore them. You need to think of Mr. Darcy in London, George Washington. Um, even today in Williamsburg, the Stremel, the tall Stremel that the Hasidic Jewish population wears that are made from either beaver or um, fisher cat. So that's probably the last remnant of beaver fur being used. But you can see some pictures there. Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that beaver fur, beaver pelts jump-started the first economy because literally they were the first currency here. So the Hudson's Bay Company pretty quickly started generating tokens that represented pelts. It was just more efficient. So these are examples of um, beaver tokens which were the, you know, the first coins of the realm. And there's John Jacob Astor himself looking very pleased with himself because by this point he's almost duped Jefferson and um, managed to build a, a global trading um, scheme based on uh, building Astoria, which is, was the first Western settlement you know, west of Mississippi. He followed Lewis and Clark's trading route, established all those uh, sites of exploration as his trading sites for the American Fur Company. And um, he thought he had it all wrapped up. He was gonna ship furs out of Astoria. They'd go to China, London, back to New York. Um, quite brilliant, quite ruthless. But he didn't factor in that within a few years, the beavers would be almost wiped out, extirpated, which they pretty much were. He didn't care because he moved on to something else. But it would pretty much seal what has been called the period of the Great Drying from 1600 to 1900. So now we talk about what 
where we are now and why there's so much excitement about beavers. Because while beavers, when they were gone, initiated a period of environmental devastation, or we initiated a period of environmental devastation by wiping them out, when beavers come back, in a fairly short period of time, they can repair and restore damaged river systems. So this um, creek on the left is a creek with beavers. And it's an example of what happens to a previously um, degraded stream or creek that has been channelized or ditched. And the water has been disconnected from its floodplain and We've done this because we've needed the water for energy, for transportation, for agriculture. And what's happened is the, the river system has ended up looking like most of the rivers and creeks we see today. It's a, it's a band of water or a thread of water in a, in a channel. Um, but actually, rivers want to look like this. Um, so pretty quickly, uh, beavers will help creeks and rivers return. And the thing that we haven't talked about is another gain, is biodiversity. So beaver wetlands are biodiversity hubs. And this is the thing that I had witnessed, which is why the transformation was so uh, remarkable. Now that I know the science of what I was observing, it's no less remarkable. In fact, it's even more remarkable. Because the water, it begins with the water. So Water in a beaver altered wetland has 15 times more plankton and microbial life. And then life cascades up from there. So study after study has shown that 30% more birds and animal species live around a beaver altered wetland or a beaver pond. And I think anyone who's lived around a beaver pond has witnessed this. You hear the birds, you see the animals, or you see the animal tracks. So where we are today, once upon a time in North America, 60 to 400 million beaver. We won't have that today because we have built infrastructure. We are living in floodplains, in low-lying areas near rivers. We, we're not going to move Hartford. We're not going to move you know, major cities. But while the estimate is that there are 10 to 15 million beaver today. Um, what's exciting is that, say out west, where beaver can be returned to the wetland. I just want to show about 10 more, 10 more minutes and then we'll, we'll finish. Um, they have a kind of outsized impact. So this slide on the left is actually a burn scar from Colorado. This is after the 2020 uh, wildfire there, which is considered a mega wildfire, one of the early mega wildfires. And when they ran um, imagery over afterwards, the green refugia was where beavers were. Not only did these beavers survive the wildfire, but one of the concerns after a wildfire goes through is cleansing uh, the water of ash, which a beaver wetland will do, and also bringing hydration in so that new growth can happen, which is what a, a beaver wetland uh, will foster. So I'm not sure if any of you have been out to Minnesota, but the largest density of beavers in the United States today is in Voyagers National Park. And I just want to share this slide with you for two reasons. First of all, on the right, you can see the um, kind of impact of beavers. So this is a corridor that over time have been carved by beaver from one of the Great Lakes to the other. And you can see the, the extent of the impact. And then on the left, they do an annual census of beaver um, colonies. So these are all lodges. So I mean, the density is really impressive. And that is what North America would have looked like uh, once upon a time. So. I want to come back east. Um, Beaverland was published in December 2022. And after the book launched, I went out to look at my beavers. 
And um, I was devastated to discover that a human had broken the dam and the water in the pond had gone down about 24 inches. The, the lodge was um, exposed. Beavers have to dive down under the water to come up into the lodge, so they actually couldn't get in or out safely, and they had fled. Um, it was December. Normally, the pond would have been covered in ice, but because it wasn't, um, there was a chance that maybe they had survived. So I hiked down the stream, and to my great amazement, discovered that they had actually created this pond of water farther down. But what was amazing to me was that they had done this in an area that only four weeks earlier in November had been completely dry. And it had been dry as long as I had known that area, and I had been walking it for years. So I want to just share with you a little bit the story of this site, which I'm still monitoring. So by January, the dam they built was three feet high. By March, it was five feet high. And what's significant about this is that they were doing this at a time when beavers do not normally make a pond. It was very much a freaky climate change story of our time. Because of the warm winter, they managed to be ice free so they could try to make a pond, but they had very little food and very little building material. So what they did is they took down two native birch. So this is the first native birch they fed on this underlying bark, the cambium. And you can see the water filling, but you can see there's still snow. Eventually, um, is it, I contacted Dr. Berkstead, the river scientist I profile in the book. She became quite excited about this situation. So did um, Mike Callahan, who I also write about in the book from the Beaver Institute. They came down, and they helped me measure the water and figure out what was going on. But nobody could figure out anything about the beavers. Um, so I just um, thought, well, what would Herb do? And uh, I built a bait pile the way I had seen him do. And sure enough, the, I brought the beavers in and set up wildlife cameras. And we identified that it was two young beavers, siblings, about two years old. And here they are. So just two, like, I don't know what happened to their parents, everyone else, but these two, a male and a female, survived. That's the female. By April, they were trying to make a lodge. They would end up um, being unsuccessful in this site and have to move on. But there they are, giving it their first try. You have to think of these beavers as like teenagers. Um, probably that summer they would have been gone off on their own, but they, they weren't you know, quite ready to head out. Uh, by the end of summer, they had built three dams, and they had started to pond an incredible amount of water, and they had built an a iconic lodge um, on, in the third pond. This is the lower dam. It was just really exciting. They had a sort of textbook. They had even built a, like a fairy tale beaver pond with their lilies. Beaver, beavers live on water lilies in the summer. It was just incredible. It was like a Disney Pixar movie. You know, these two-year-old refugees, could they make it? And they were doing it. So I just want to share with you very quickly um, the history of this water, because it it's really interesting what they did. So this is the site. The star down there is where they built their dam. And if you look, you can see it's actually dry all the way up. This is the stream system, but you wouldn't know it in 1934 because there are no beavers here. This is farmland. Beavers were only reintroduced to Connecticut in 1914, about eight miles to the west. They hadn't gravitated over yet. 1990, the same site. There are beavers here. They've made it over. This is a classic beaver altered wetland. They're in the stream system. They've filled it with water. And you can see that the, 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 the stream system is reconnected. The farmer has taken advantage. And in the upper pond, he, he dug a berm. By 2016, the beavers are gone. They were actually trapped out. And the farmer has decided to keep the upper pond um, but down below, it's just completely dry. So what's interesting is 
These two young beavers went to a completely dry area where there was not continuous running water and built a dam. So they enabled subsurface water to come back up. And this is the part of the river system that is there. It's the water we don't see, but is incredibly valuable. Um, technically, this was part of, this was an intermittent stream that had disappeared. So they literally pulled up a hidden section of the stream system and reconnected it. And Dr. Berkstead helped me figure out the stats on this. They were these two teenage beavers in a matter of months were filling this area with 8,300 gallons a day. So a tremendous amount of hydraulic function was coming back to the stream system in a very short amount of time with two pretty inexperienced young beavers. Here it is from above. Here's the lower dam. It was just really beautiful. Um, we had an extreme set of rain events in September. This dam would be washed out. Their lodge would be exposed. I thought maybe the beavers were killed. You know, I thought, oh no, here it is. Here it goes again. Um, but I eventually found them. They had retreated back to their original site and started gnawing again on the first native birch. I think they were like traumatized and they went back to the first tree. And what was really interesting was by October they had started building a lodge again in the very upper dam, upper pond this time. They reinforced their first dam, decided to stay there. And this time they're building a lodge right smack in the middle. I think they were like building a lodge on the side was too dangerous. We learned from that, here we are. You can see their lodge in the middle. So they're learning and adapting, and they're still there. And what's also amazing is the farmer whose land this is on, um, after he's the one who broke the dam, um, I gave him a copy of Beaverland, and I just said, um, you know, thank you for letting me walk on your land. You know, I kind of really like your beavers. And I wrote this book. I hope you read it. And uh, <laughs> um, he did read it, and he called me up. He said, I didn't mean to kill the beavers. So we started this whole conversation. And the point is, often cultural practices about managing beavers are just based on not understanding um, that there are other ways to coexist with them. He was worried about a farm road um, flooding. So now he has a different plan. He's going to put a pond leveler in a flow device to manage that water. And he, you know, I send him wildlife pictures of the beavers. He's really into the beavers. He's really happy that they're on his land. So, you know, people can change. They can learn. But they need information and they need a chance. So um, this, what the beavers are doing here, I just want to say is incredibly significant now in light of the Supreme Court decision last um, May, the Sackett decision. So that decision took protection off of 70% of the river system because it said that it narrowed the definition of the um, Clean Water Act to only apply to basically visible, continuous, connected water. So that isn't how the river system works. The main trunk of the river, the Connecticut River is going to be visible and continuous, but 70% of what feeds the Connecticut River is tributaries, right? Um, and if you pollute them, all the pollution is going to go down, A. But B, um, a lot of those streams and creeks are intermittent, just like the section of the stream system that the beavers um, you know, brought back up. So um, in light of that, the, the work that beavers do repairing stream systems is, is even more vital. And protecting our watersheds is even more um, important. It's really on states and individuals, I think, to step up. Because um, the Clean Water Act had been a bipartisan law that was really the last defense uh, and, and an important defense that had been there for decades. And it's, it's been dismantled. So this just got me, I just want to leave here. This got me thinking about like the citizen scientist, because it occurred to me that I've sort of become a citizen scientist without really intending to. Um, because I'm writing, I'm working on a new book about rivers, and then I'm out checking on my beavers and sending information to, to scientists. Because 
while we know a lot about the value of beavers and that, that information is being harnessed for environmental restoration projects throughout the country, we don't know a lot about the animal itself because beavers just have been highly unstudied. So any information that people have about beavers is incredibly valuable now. So I thought, well, who are, natu who are citizen scientists? And I realized, well, we have a long tradition of them in, in the United States, starting with Ben Franklin and his, his kites and electricity. But I think um, H.G. Thoreau is probably our most famous poet naturalist. And in fact, the measurements he made of those ponds in Concord, you know, we would measure the temperature of the water, are now actually quite valuable to cli climate scientists who are going back and reading his journals. And of course, um, we're really indebted to Rachel Carson. Um, we might think of Nabokov because of his very questionable book, Lolita, but he actually has five species of butterflies named after him. And um, then, of course, there's Jane Goodall, who made some of her most important observations before she was fully trained. But I wanted to just end by sharing um, this slide of Dorothy Bernie Richards, who I also think is a citizen, was a citizen scientist. And April 7th was National Beaver Day, International Beaver Day. Um, and it was founded in her honor, actually. People are starting to try to kind of um, shed some light on her. But look at her as she graduated high school. That's her when she um, adopted the two beaver kits in 38. And then that's what happened to her. Wow. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little scary, actually. <laughs> um, but I just want to end here because I think a lot about Jane Goodall, who just turned 90, and this wonderful quote that we can't get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. I think we are at a moment where the world really, really needs us. And um, beavers changed the way I see the world. Um, and I'm really grateful to them for that. And I think I'll just end there, but I will say um, I'm happy to take questions um, now and over book signing. And also, if anyone wants to contact me later with questions, I also have a Instagram with a lot of beaver info. Some really good resources are the Beaver Institute and Beaver Wetlands and Wildlife here in the East, if you want to pursue um, information about coexistence strategies. There's a lot of funding. There's a lot of work going on um, that's quite exciting. So thank you so much. Can we take a couple questions? Yeah. Well, that, I mean, I think, thank you for that, and thank you for that work. It's really important. And I, I should say, um, I think you've raised a really good point, and I really like the term, beavers are called a keystone species in Western science, which is that they're so important that, like, the brick of a medieval arch, if you take that brick out, the arch falls down. If you take beavers out of the larger ecology, the ecology falls apart. But in indigenous environmental science, ecological knowledge bases, they use the term keystone relative. And I really like that term, and I've started using it, because if we say keystone relative, conservation is wrapped up with science. So it's not just, as you point out, what beavers can do for us, but what we need to do for beavers to support beavers um, in, in the land. It's more relational, because we really are at that point. So thank you.
think that's a really great question. Well, I think to find out and get involved, um, if there's any way to vote and support that um, bill that you just mentioned, I think that's important implications for Vermont. But I always tell people, start local. So wherever you live, there are probably beavers right there. And the town is probably trying to manage them with cultural practices that are, you know, hopefully they are updated, but they may well not be. Because often the practices that go along with managing beaver have to do with looking at, at a sort of degraded river system before beavers were there. I mean, I think it's just taking people a while to ab absorb this new way of looking at beavers that they're part of a healthy river ecology. So if beavers are there, it's actually because that's what the river system needs. And so we really need to kind of start thinking that way. Um, but I think in my town, for example, the highway department has a culture of just trapping beavers instead of looking if a road's being flooded, can we put a flow device in there? And yet, um, they just didn't think about it. They didn't know. In Connecticut, there's actually a grant program that towns can access to get that subsidized. So as a citizen, you know, citizens brought that forward to the, to the selectmen, and there's kind of no argument against it. You know, so I think often when you can find that overlying mutual interest, um, which is often why I default to the saying sort of what beavers can do for us, even though I, I take your point well. But I think when people see it's in their interest to coexist with beavers, you're going to get a lot farther than just saying you should like beavers. Because <laughs> people will say, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't want to like beavers. <laughs> Go away. Because um, there's, there's a lot of cultural antipathy towards beavers that I, I have found it just, just more helpful to kind of think about how your needs can be met better. Andover uh, has a, um, a really great case study where the town put in flow devices where they used to actually hire a fur trapper every year. And they saved so much money putting in a flow device over that that the citizens were quite happy to not have to pay that bill every year. So I mean, th there, are, there are, Beaver Institute has some of the, these studies that can be brought to a town and say, look, how much money are you spending on this? Uh, let's, uh, so that'd be my advice. But also, um, the Beaver Institute has national working groups throughout the country working on changing policy, because that also has to happen. Out west, beavers who are creating a problem in one town can be translocated or moved to an upper watershed where they're not going to create a problem. Here in most states, you can't do that in the east. And those kinds of um, policies need to change. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Well, I have a, I have a simple question. Those hats that they were wearing, men wore them. Did women wear them? Are they still made? The hats. Um, I think um, I think mostly men wore them because they were mostly outdoor hats for that time. But um, I looked on the Stetson site recently because you know cowboy hats were made of beaver felt once upon a day, and they are selling refurbished beaver felt hats for quite a lot of money. So the felt is so durable it can be refurbished and sold. It's not being made anymore. Um, but there, it also makes the best pool table felt. <laughs> so, but, but there, there just aren't um, people making it. So, maybe up, up here. Yeah. yeah. One more. So, last question right over here. And then we can. I'm happy to keep the conversation going over here, over books. But that way, people can get up and move around if they want to move. Uh, one thing I loved about the book was that you you had the chapters about Herb and also about the fur auction, and my father was in the fur business for all yeah. his life and yeah. used to dabble in beaver casters, and that description of the snapping of the fur is really... Yeah. But I think what's important by, by having that in there is that we have to learn to coexist as people, in addition with the beavers, so if people have our trappers or people who have different mindsets than we than we might, uh, if we don't coexist with them and learn how to do that, 
then we're not going to be able to deal with all these other issues. Yeah, I, I thank you for that. I mean, it was, it was, I really wanted this book to build bridges. And um, I thought that I learned a lot from Herb and other fur trappers that initially really kind of challenged a lot of my assumptions. And then a lot of what, I, I realized we had a lot more in common than I ever thought. And, um, and, and I had a lot of respect also for the knowledge base. So it was really poignant for me when we were doing this research project. I was there with, you know, I was talking to river, uh, uh, beaver mammologists in Canada and these river scientists, and then nobody could figure out how to find the beavers. And I'm like, Herb knows how to find the beavers. <laughs> I was like, so there's this knowledge base that was quite valuable. But I think you're talking about something deeper than that, which is that it's very important for us to learn from one another and, and, and just, you know, when I went to my first trapper gatherings, I must have sat in the parking lot for 20 minutes thinking, wow, this is a really different culture. Can I go in here? And then when I finally did, I, I was just really glad I did. It reminded me that, you know, we. We're, we're people. We have a lot more in common uh, than, we, than we often think. And hunters and trappers and anglers have participated and contributed to the conservation movement in this country profoundly, which is one of the things I also wanted to write about. So two weeks ago, I was out in California, in central California, looking at Walters Creek with a group of people who were going to work on how to restore it. And one of the members was from Trout Unlimited. Um, historically, trout people had taken out beaver dams and been against beavers, but, but they've kind of realized, you know, the, it, it, was, it was just a really interesting conversation. And there are also times when beavers cannot stay and they, they have to be removed. So fur trappers like Herb, who harvest the fur, use the meat. I think it's much better that that happens than that that animal ends up in a dumpster, which is what happens if you call animal control. So, you know, I think it's, 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 it's important to take a wide view. So thank you.